actually today I'm going to be focusing in on uh, nonverbal uh, non uh, performances, nonverbal action, nonverbal communication. So it'll be s focused on stage presence uh, rather than talking and developing ideas. We're going to be um, working on our presence on stage. So uh, I have uh, the minimum required, and so we'll get started. Anybody is welcome. Yeah. James Fenimore Cooper. Uh, just a second. <laughs> Hold on. Let me see if this works. Oh, it does. Okay, good. Uh, James Fenimore Cooper was born in Burlington, New Jersey on September 15, 1789. In 1790, his father, William Cooper, moved the family to Cooperstown, New York, where James spent his youth and received his early education. Cooper's father was the most prominent citizen of the town. The site was founded by him, and the name of Cooperstown was adopted in his honor. He spent the years from 1806 until 1808 as a common seaman on the merchant ship, the Sterling. In 1808, he was commissioned a midshipman in the United States Navy, where he served until 1811. In 1809, his father, William Cooper, was killed by a political opponent. In 1811, James Fenimore Cooper was married to Susan Delancey the daughter of a very rich and influential family from the Westchester County. Years of juggling the convoluted affairs left to him and his brothers by their father and Fenimore Cooper's attempts to build his own wealth occupied many years of his life while still enjoying the bliss of a happy family. Cooper was a very literate, well-read individual and shared his love of books with all his children. He decided to become a writer to help alleviate some of his financial problems. In 1820, Cooper published Precaution, a romance imitating the popular books of Jane Austen. His first book was not a particular success, but he discovered a genuine pleasure in writing. He turned to the sources he knew intimately the sea, and the area now known as New York State. In 1821, Cooper published The Spy, critically acclaimed as the first important historical novel in American li literature set during the American Revolution around Westchester County. His next book, The Pilot, is the first American novel worthy of the classification of sea fiction, where Cooper made excellent use of his nautical training and experiences on the sea. His books in early, about early American history were published and received with acclaim both here in the United States and Europe. Among the first books, first books he wrote in the early years of his writing career were The Pioneers and The Last of the Mohicans. Cooper moved with his family to Europe, taking up residence. Here, his children obtained a good education, and he could focus on securing agreements with European publishers about copyrights, royalties, and other matters. He settled in Paris in 1826 and remained in Europe for almost eight years, enjoying great success. In 1827, while in Europe, he had published The Prairie, the third of the leather stocking tales. Also while there, he wrote several others based on the sea and events set in Europe. He returned to the United States in 1833 where some of the papers he had written critical of the expansionist and nationalistic policies of the United States were met with resentment. He lamented the loss of the pioneer spirit and as a fervent Christian felt that Christian ideals were not being practiced. Europe had definitely left a mark on him. He was never really able to abandon. He was a patriot and loved his country, but his eight-year absence had harmed his credibility. Notwithstanding lawsuits for slander, libel, and property rights, he continued his writing career, and he had lots of lawsuits. 
It was during this period he wrote the last two books of the Leather Stocking series, The Pathfinder and The Deer Slayer. One included strong references to seafaring, a subject he loved, on the, on the, big, on the big lakes. And the other is a book about Natty Bumpo as a raw youth on his first war path with his friend Chingach Gook. Now, I can't even begin to imagine, you know, as a writer, it's, it took me four years to write my book with a computer and all the bells and whistles a computer gives to you. He wrote about 50 in his lifetime, not fiction and nonfiction, and he wrote it by hand and very quickly, plus having to stay on top of all of his legal and estate affairs. I can't even begin to imagine that. His editors, uh, they say in his book, really had a hard time reading his writing, so they really had to extrapolate. And sometimes in his books, you, something doesn't quite flow, but they made it flow as best as possible. There's a, a picture of his daughter right there, uh, Susan Fenimore Cooper, the eldest surviving daughter. He had one daughter before who died very young. Uh, he writes a lot about uh, Otsego Lake, a.k.a. Glimmer Glass, uh, and that's its, uh, the, it's called Otsego Lake, but everybody knows it, knows it as Glimmer Glass. It's a big lake, and you can see that it is fringed by forest. Can you imagine what it must have been when he was a youth? There was more forest and less uh, settlements and population. So he and his brother um, were pretty much uh, the youngest of the clan, pretty much had the place to themselves to roam about. And how, and the details that he uses to describe mostly this area in his books are done with, you can tell, with a lot of love and depth and feeling. And it comes through the pages. These are the back, this is the backdrop to most of his stories, including The Last of the Mohicans and Pathfinder. So um, I found it interesting that everybody in the books, James Fenimore books, had, had other names. Other than their Christian name, they were known by other names. And I was wondering, uh, I asked myself if that was a custom in the, pl in, in that, the settlements, but it was definitely a custom among the Native Americans. Uh, you got the name that you earned for whatever achievement you had. And since Natty Bumpo um, was adopted into the Delaware uh, tribe, um, he was called, when they adopted him, um, Pathfinder, excuse me, Deerslayer was his first name. And then he got uh, another name, uh, the Long Rifle, except the French version of the Long Rifle. Uh, then, of course, Hawkeye, uh, because no matter how old he got, he, was, he could shoot uh, his wonderful rifle with uh, deadly and precise, uh, with precision. And Pathfinder, because he never got lost. And of course, leather stocking, because of the, the, you know, how he dressed. And he is a fictional character, so, um, so you, 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 if he feels real, even though he's a fictional character, something like Sherlock Holmes still feels real, even though he is. Uh, Ching Gotch Gook, uh, Delaware Mohican and childhood friend of Natty Bumpo. Uh, and the Mohicans are, uh, excuse me, and then Uncas, Ching Gotch Gooks, uh, had a son. Uh, and he, he is the last of the Mohicans, because he dies in the last of the Mohicans, not Ching, not Ching Gotch Gook. The Mohicans, uh, that's the name that they use, are currently known as Stockbridge Muncie and in Mo and, uh, Mohican Nation in Wisconsin. And it's known, uh, the name means uh, people of the waters that are never still. And that probably means the ocean rather than just a river where they originally came from. These are the books that he wrote. And I put the order in which they were written. Um, my favorite is The Pioneers. I think that's the one he worked on the most. Um, then The Last of the Mohicans, um, I don't think that is quite such a good book. I don't know why it's so popular. And then The Prairie is, um, has a lot of flaws in it, but you know it, it serves its purpose to kill off um, leather stocking. 
However, later on, I guess it must have been a really popular character, uh, he writes uh, Pathfinder and the Deerslayer, kind of fills in the rest of, of Natty Bumpo's life. So this is the chronological order of Natty Bumpo's life, and these are the books that follow his chronological life order. And then the, there's a list of the pioneers as um, the books in the order in which he wrote. Oh, he, I said 50. Here it says 29 books and papers interspersed with his leather stocking tails. This is what the United States looked like when James Flannery Cooper began writing his books. I thought this was an interesting, um, gives you some kind of idea of his mindset when he was writing these books. While this talk focuses on the interesting literary character created piecemeal by James Fenimore Cooper, Natty Bumpo, it was impossible to not also include in this presentation the actual historic events Cooper uses as the backdrop to his stories. The French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War, for example. Cooper's personality and childhood memories, as well as his experience as a seaman, shine through the pages. In the first book of the so-called Leather Stocking series, The Pioneers, he addresses what appears to him the potential loss of the wilderness and the natural environment he had enjoyed in his childhood. <coughs> Excuse me. His character, Natty Bumpo, features for the first time in this book as an aged frontiersman already obsolete Although he only has a supporting role, he is the voice of Cooper's unresolved conflict between economic advancement and the waste wrecked on the forests, rivers, and lakes of the wilderness, <coughs> lands of the burgeoning New York State. The wreckage affected on the Indian population with far worse consequences appears only secondary in his narrative. In the next book he wrote, The Last of the Mohicans, it serves his story to use for dramatic effect the customs of Native Americans in this area. Here he reprises Natty Bumpo and Chingachgook's physical vigor. The author expresses his respect for the First Peoples, striving to incorporate into his books, however imperfectly, their story, whether in the narrative or in the footnotes. And, I, and during this time, when he was writing this book, other authors were writing books about Native Americans because by this time um, their, their population was dwindling, they were pushed back west, farther west, and, uh, but they still had this mythical quality and especially the Europeans found the American Indian uh, an interesting, um, interesting subject to read about. So there were other books about the Indians that he probably used as part of his research. Uh, Natty Bumpo ideally personifies Cooper's guilty conscience about the unregulated land grabs of whole swaths of land from the Native Americans for farming or as elegant estates for the cream of the neo-colonial Euro-Americans. After the last of the Mohicans, Cooper was ready to sunset this character with his third book, The Prairie, Nettie Bumpo is portrayed as aging again, a frail hunter, guide and scout, bitter over the loss of the forest wilderness he loved, and forced to go farther west to the wild open spaces of the, of the prairies so necessary to his way of life. Even here he seeks and is given, re given refuge among Native Americans, and it is among these people he breathes his last. But James Fenimore Cooper was a shrewd, driven writer and resuscitated Natty Bumpo two more times in The Deer Slayer, when he's a youth, and then The Pathfinder. The character was too eloquent and interesting to abandon, so Cooper, in the end, gave him a full life, creating a patchwork of life experiences that do not, fo lo no, do not flow logically, but no one really notices. Harden.
over here. Yeah, we'll make it. She called me. I'm to be the voice of this natty bumpo. I have childish recollections of a life in a settlement of colonists with a widowed mother of simple and homely tastes and habits. She knew only how to read the Bible and taught the goodness of Scripture to me and my sister. We lived near the Delawares of the Hudson River Valley, a tribe of Indians once great and powerful. When my mother died, I went to live with her people, but soon learned that farming wasn't for me. I left my sister there and returned to the Delaware people. As for farms, they have their uses, and there's them that likes to pass their lives on them. But what comfort can a man look for in a clearing that he can't find in double quantities in the forest? If sustenance is wanted, the streams will furnish them. Where else are you to find your shades and laughing springs and leaping brooks and venerable trees a thousand years old in a clearing? You don't find them, but you find their disabled trunks marking the earth like headstones in a graveyard. It seems to me that the people who live in such places must be always thinking of their own ends and the universal decay, not of the decay that is brought about by time and nature, but the decay that is follows waste and violence. I grew up the Chingotguch, who is my brother in everything but blood. We learned to We roamed as soon as we knew how to walk through the forest hunting venison and other game for the hearth fires, hearth fires. I had a talent for the sport and soon learned the name of Deerslayer, even though my Christian name was Nathaniel Bumpo, known to my own people as Natty Bumpo. Uh, it would warm the heart within you to sit in their lodges of winter night and listen to the traditions of the ancient greatness and power of the Mohicans. Although I lived among these people, I always considered myself Christian born and educated. I always knowed my arts were of the white man and their ways of the red man. Back then, the forest was made of trees who were felled by age and not by man's greed. See that tree? Like so many millions of its brethren, it lies where it has fallen and now moldering under the slow but certain influence of the seasons. There is a lake that the Indians call a place of salutation. It's about nine miles long, and the headwaters of the Susquehanna River. The placid and limpid, limpid lake clothed in dark pines has an irregular margin and offers sweet repose. On all its sides, nothing meets my eyes but the mirror-like surface of the lake the placid view of the heaven, 
and the dense setting of woods, a native scene bathed in sunlight, something left in the ordering of the Lord. From the time of my youth, I have been one of those frontiersmen who dread the approaches of civilization as a cartelment on our lawless empire. <laughs> and that is why I'm glad this lake has no name, because the custom of the pale faces to christen land or water with a name foretells its waste and destruction. I was given many names, such as Deer Slayer, Pathfinder, Hawkeye, and many a great lord has got a title that he did not half so well merit. Though, if truth be said, I rather pride myself in finding my way where there is no path than in finding it where there is. Most people don't know the difference between a trail and a path, though one is a matter of the eye while the other is little more than scent. My brother, Chingachgook, is a mighty warrior with the blood of chiefs in his veins. His son, Uncas, who died in tender youth, when growed enough, joined us in our hunts, and we traveled far and wide through the wilderness where contentment companionship and respect was our lot, winters and summers, nights and days. We roved the wilderness in company, eating of the same dish, one sleeping while the other watched. The name Chim Gotchgook, translated in white man's speech, means the great serpent name so for his cunning and wisdom. If you judge of Indian cunning by the rules you find in books or by white sagacity, you will be led astray, if not to your death. I never learned to read and write, never finding any use in the art. My gifts are the woods, the trails, the sights, the smells, the wilderness. And because of my gifts, I was sought out by His Majesty the King's army as a scout, guide, protector, and procurer of vittles. I don't go to anyone's charts, just follow my own way of being Christian. I have heard it said that there are men who read books to convince themselves there is a God. If any such readers there be, and they follow me from sun to sun through the windings of the forest, they shall see enough to teach them that they are fools. The only book I read or cared about reading was the one which God has opened afore all his creatures in the noble forests, broad lakes, rolling rivers, blue skies, and the winds and tempests and sunshine and other glorious marvels of the land. This book I can read, and I find it full of wisdom and knowledge. The woods are never silent to such as can understand their meaning. Days at a time I have traveled them alone without feeling the want of company, and as for conversation for such as comprehend their language, there is no want of rationale or instructive discourse. At my 40th year, love overtook me. Ah, me. <laughs> I told her that afore we met, I had a sort of pleasure in following up the hounds 
striking a trail of the Iroquois, scrimmages and ambushments and found satisfaction in it according to my gifts. But all those things lost their charms when I met Mabel Dunham. I never noted afore, but girls are of more account in this life than I could have believed. But it was not to be. Her heart was for a sturdy, handsome youth called Jasper. My lot has been cast in the wilderness, the land of my birth, and to it I have given my arm and experience. The leaves are my mattress bed, the sky my ceiling, my light the sun and moon, my charts the canopy of the giants of the forest. I've often thought that he is happiest who has the least to leave behind him when the summons calls. Now here I am, an old hunter and a scout and a guide. Although I do not own a foot of land on earth, yet do I enjoy and possess more than great King George. With the heavens over my head to keep me in mind of the last great hunt and the dried leaves neath my feet, I tramp over the ground as freely as if I was its lord and owner. And what more need a heart desire? Thank you, Hardin. Hardin is such a good actor. I've been, I've been looking for all kinds of ways to get him to do something. That, and so I wrote that piece for him, and I think it fits him perfectly. <laughs> so what I'd like to do right now, because I can move on to the next section, I'd like to open up for some questions. In response to Aaron, I was saying that's why I think I, I just love this character, Natty Bumpo. When I discovered him a few years ago, I mean, the last thing I wanted to read was James Fenimore Cooper. I just, just wasn't into that kind of literature. Early American history, you know, I'm more into ancient Roman <laughs> history and Celts and things like that. And so uh, I just kind of stumbled upon this. And it really did open up a new world for me as far as l literature and as far as another type of history that I was not previously uh, interested in. And, um, and when I discovered Nettie Bumpo and then in the Pioneer, I'm going, aha, this is an amazing writer. Um, he is, an, he's the environmental, to me, he's the environmentalist. You know, I belong to a Hardin and I and a few other folks here. We belong to uh, the Chemeketans, which is a hiking club. And it also was designed to be a conservation club. I've been a member for 30 years, but the club has been around for over 80 years. And, uh, and it's the sentiments that Natty Bumpo, and I used his words in the, st in the various books, um, really um, speaks to me, and I think it speaks to a lot of people that uh, love the forest and love the woods. And uh, when I'm in a place like that, and or this is why I live in Oregon, you know, I feel really in, um, I, I really feel whole. So I love those things, and that's why these books really, really speak to me. Joel. Well, I'm going to take an opposite point of view because <coughs> there seems to be a lot of literary critics who really put down uh, this author, and primarily because it's highly romanticized. It's not a realistic approach at all. Perhaps was not intended to be. Uh, he he, uh, the dialogue in his books was criticized as being unrealistic. Uh, you know, we just heard an example of that. Beautifully written and, and sends a good message, but but not uh, not particularly realistic. Nor maybe it should be. I just like your comment on that because there are modern critics who uh, who are not too supportive of this author. 
Well, remember my uh, one of my initial comments was that he wrote everything. He wrote everything by hand, and then uh, can you imagine <laughs> writing by hand, and then sheaves of paper, and he just hand and he's in the meantime, he has like six or seven children that he's trying to you know raise with his wife, and has lawsuits, and five of his older brothers, all four or five of his older brothers little by little die. I mean, he, he's the youngest. And uh, he didn't think he had to deal with a mess of the estate of his father who left uh, his the estate uh, with lots of debts, with unclear title to certain plots of land. So he was really overwhelmed by the death of his brothers who p little by little he became responsible for everything. And he did not have money, so he, ha he married money. But he did not have money, so he went turned to literature. Um, he thought that was one way of making money, and he was good at it. But writing so quickly, he would hand off all this work. I mean, to him, that was a money-making enterprise. And so I can see why um, people. I, I, I think he, if you know, if what I would th say is that if I were given the, these books and I found them boring the way they were written, I really did. I can't imagine why they let uh, high school kids read these because that would turn them off immediately to literature. These books need to be rewritten because there are a lot of flaws in the writing, lots of them, in the plot line and all kinds of stuff. But you know, this is what he was making money off of this and he was successful at it. Nobody knew noticed back then because that's how everybody wrote. You know, if you read his contemporaries, everybody wrote the way he did because that was the acceptable format. For our modern taste, no. It's not. And as far as um, he was very Christian, he was very much a man of his time, very religious. So he had very precise ideas about women's behavior. So that is definitely in there. And he goes on and on about God and Christ. That is really close to his heart. So he's not writing just a good story, an adventure story. He's also communicating his faith through his book because he, he feels that's part of what his faith is to share that that uh, the Christianity. Um, yeah, his he had to read other authors, other sources, and maybe other sources were not as not very good. I think he had firsthand knowledge of a lot of the Indians of that area because there were still Indians when he was growing up, the Native Americans, and I think he had firsthand knowledge of a lot of frontiersmen. Um, I think Natty Bump was kind of a composite of all of them. So no, he was not a writer. And he didn't even finish college because he, he was such a prank. And he was the youngest son. I mean, he, you know when you're the youngest son, you never, you never uh, expect to be handed the estate and have to worry about it. You just think, I'm going to get married. He marry up, married up, married money. He thought he was just going to be a, you know, a landowner and enjoy his children and family. No, he ended up having the whole burden of the problem of the estate, of the Cooper's estate dumped on his shoulders, so he didn't want that. So he had to deal with that. So um, uh, I think that was part of the problem of his writing. Any other questions? Kathy. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Who was it? Oh, Kathy, yes. Kathy, hi there. Kathy. Yeah, it's, it's Kathy, I guess. Now I need to tell you again. Uh, I also was a, a longtime member of the Chemekovans, and I was a backpacker, among other things. And I used to just look forward to the time when we left the cars and uh, behind, and all we had was what we carried on our back. And it might have to last for s seven days or 10 days, my longest one. And uh, I just love the freedom of not having any strings attached. Yes. I know what you mean. This is Ken. Uh, I had a not a question. Oh, yeah. Am I not supposed to be next? No. Yeah. Ken is next. Okay. Yeah. And okay. And this isn't a question. It's a testimonial. <laughs> 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 when I was in junior high school, my dad gave me the book Deerslayer, and I'll tell you, I read that thing and loved it. It was just wonderful, and I had all kinds of images of running silently through the woods and outrunning the Indians and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, and then when that movie came out a few years ago, The Last of the Mohicans, mm -hmm. that opening scene where they're running through the woods, 
just captures to me the whole spirit of that book when they're when they're going after the mm -hmm. deer. Yeah. Hi, this is Solvay. Yeah. Uh, some of this has been covered, but what Aaron was saying, it, that seems backwards. Most people want to be leaving something, but I think when you when you kind of read into it that this is this is also James Fenimore's Cooper speaking, he's sort of saying, I hope I don't leave any lawsuits for my kids. I don't leave any Something, of the crud I yeah. had to deal with. Yeah. But also, the, if you live with, with people with the wisdom of the Native Americans, you leave no footprint. Mm -hmm. you, you leave the land as you yes. found it as, as yes. much as you can. Yeah. I the, 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 oh, uh, what I found amazing is this is, was written in 1822, uh, the Pioneers. I think it was 1822. And uh, even then, there was the controversy about leaving a lighter footprint on the wilderness. Even then, there was the issue of, and he was not alone, of overcutting the forest or, or taking, uh, in the pioneers, they fish, they go to the lake and they go with nets and they get more fish than the community can eat. And it's, uh, it's, it's a crime. And so they, and, it, and he brings it out in the s as part of the story because it really did happen. Because James Fenimore Cooper, you can tell the parts that he includes that are real. I've done that with my book, and uh, you, there, there are some parts that suck, they're unique in the in the story in the narrative because they really did happen. You know, the strangest things are the strangest thing is reality. And he wrote that it really did happen, that there was a lot of waste. And then there were w winters where they would have starved to death without, you know, uh, without anything. So, um, so he was aware of that. Even though he was a gentleman, he lived a very privileged life. Um, he, he was still aware. I thought that was wonderful that he would be sensitive to that. And, and leaving things behind. You know, when I went to the Peace Corps, I emptied out my house. And I was happy, <laughs> and uh, you know, go I went to the everything in a backpack, and I was ready to live out of that backpack for the next two years. So it was wonderful, you know, having to empty out the house. Some of it in storage, of course, but um, yeah, I can. You don't. You, you can. When I came back from the Peace Corps, I just bought things at Goodwill. People gave me things. I just didn't feel the urge to refurnish my house the way I had it before. Yeah. I'll just also quote um, George and Ira Gershwin from Porgy and Bess. I got plenty of nothing and nothing. Yes, plenty nothing for plenty me. for me. Yep. I here, lightly. here. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I just David. wanted to make a comment. I've, r I've done a lot of reading of the period because this is one of my favorite periods in history. And there's a lot of irony in this Anglo point of view because the, the French were in Canada. And the Seven Years' War was a war between the English and the French. Mainly in Europe, it was different. But the French were much more uh, friendly to the Indians. That's, that's why we call it the French and Indian War. We were fighting the French and the Indians. And they had uh, much less impact on the forest and on the land and on the Indian way of life than the Anglos did. The Anglos were basically driving the Indians west uh, across the Appalachian Mountains and then further and further you west. Mean the that's what happened. That's what, yeah. Well, us too. We we were British. Yeah, the British. And so that's why you find the Delawares. They were originally in Pennsylvania. They were uh, taken over by the Iroquois, and then when the uh, English uh, Americans arrived, they pushed them away, further and further west. So th this this whole idea that we're the good guys. And the French and the Indians are the bad guys. It was ridiculous, but all our narration is written that way. Yes, his narration is written that way. But you have to understand, he knew who his audience was. You know, he was a writer. You know, this is uh, the ugly fa part of writing. I'm going to stop the questions there because David has brought me into the next section of uh, of this narrative. Or do you want to take a break now? Do it's a con I have a little bit more, and it's uh, it's about the history. In fact, w reading these books made me want to read the history and become more familiar with it. So the next piece of my presentation will be will be about the Native Americans, the First Nations. Uh, there is no time to do credit to the First Nations history of the early 1600s 
when the first Europeans, the Dutch, uh, made contact with them for trading purposes and to acquire natives for the slave trade. Slavery was practiced among the First Nations. The Dutch found a complex system of alliances and conflicts that had nothing to do with the presence of the Europeans, but which over time changed and merged with the territorial and material goals of the Native Americans. From what I was able to understand, the lingua franca of the region may have been Algonquin. The names and histories of the First Nations also changed depending on which Europeans they came into contact, the Dutch, French, or the British. The Mohicans, or as some scholars say is the correct name, Mahicans, originally occupied the eastern seaboard of what is now the land around the Hudson River Valley as one of many groups caught up in the complex negotiations and conflict for natural resources and later conflict for firearms. Once the interests of the Dutch, French, and British were added into the mix, decades of wars were stirred up by fluctuating alliances by both Native Americans and Europeans. The original Mahican homeland was the Hudson River Valley, bordered by the Catskills Mountains, later Champlain, the uh, Shohari River in the west, to the crest of the Berkshire Mountains and north to the Green Mountains in southern Vermont. Although culturally similar to other woodland Algonquin, the Mohican were shaped by their constant warfare with the neighboring Iroquois. Politically, the Mohican were a confederacy of five tribes with as many as 40 villages. Mohican villages were governed by hereditary sachems, that's S-A-C-H-E-M-S determined through the female line that advised in a council the clan leaders. The Mohicans had three clans, bear, wolf, and turtle. Those are symbols you, si you still see today. In addition to the councils, there were also warriors who were put into positions of leadership when during warfare it was necessary to have someone who could operate under pressure. During the conflict, the war leader exercised almost dictatorial power. And what I found interesting is this is the same model that the ancient Romans used. The Mohicans are today very much alive and well in Wisconsin under the name of the Stockbridge Muncie Indians. I thought uh, I would just show you this picture of the area. This is the uh, New York, the state of New York. And you can see Cooperstown, where the number 16 is. Uh, Cooperstown is near there. Uh, you can see, uh, and Otsego Lake, the lake that he wrote about, is right there in Cooperstown. Uh, what I found interesting when I did this, the reading and the research on this is how many rivers and lakes there are in that area. You can see they feature prominently in uh, in F Cooper's books. They're always riding a river, on a river, going to a river or, or a spring, um, and these were mineral springs in the area. So um, and the Erie Lake and all of those. And this area was also um, the platform of the um, of the conflicts with the French and Indians, then the conflicts with the British, and the various other conflicts that they had that they needed to resolve. Um, internally and with Britain. And there's one thing I want to show you. Rome, there's a Rome, New York there. Can you see that near number eight? That's where I lived for about a year. We like the name Rome, so that's where we ended up. <laughs> so um, French and Indian War. Are you, you can't, if you're, if you're going to be, I think the, the best part of, of um, Reading the, the books of Natty, uh, excuse me, uh, of James Fenimore Cooper with regards to Natty Bumpo is you really, without knowing the history and the background information about the Indians, about the history, about the culture, about the Dutch, about the French, it really almost doesn't make sense. So, um, so you really need, if you want to get a feel for early American uh, history, you need to do all this other research. And this book really prompted me to do this research. And it really gave texture to the stories I was reading. 
Uh, the French authorities in North America began to establish a string of forts in the Ohio country west of the Allegheny Mountains, 1634 to 1763. Their intent was to keep fur trading and, uh, excuse me, fur trapping and trading activities in the hands of French citizens and to deny the area to British colonists. In the 1740s, a group of Virginians received from the Crown a massive grant of lands in the Ohio Valley. How they thought they could do that, I don't know. That's another research, I guess. The subsequent Ohio Company was established to invest in Western lands and secondarily to engage in the fur trade. Understandably, tensions between the contending powers mounted rapidly. The picture was further complicated by the area's native al al allegiances. As a rule, most of the tribes tended to favor the French, who enjoyed a reputation for conducting business more fairly than the British. Further, the French trappers and traders did not threaten to inundate the region with settlers, unlike the British colonists. In 1753, George Washington, age 21, who had been trained as a surveyor, and a small group of men were dispatched into the disputed territory by Virginia Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie. He was a member of the Ohio Company, as were Washington and his half-brother Lawrence. The intent was to deliver a letter to pro uh, protest to the French officials who summarily refused the request to vacate. Hello, yeah. They were there. During this journey, uh, Washington noted a strategically located site at the confluence of the Allegheny and the Monongahela Rivers, where the Ohio River is formed and is the location of present-day Pittsburgh. Acting on Washington's intelligence report, British officials sent a small force to the area where they began to construct a fort. Their labors were interrupted by a much larger French contingent, which chased off the British, then completed the fortification, naming it Fort Duquesne. The following year, Washington and his troops returned, ambushed a group of French and Indians, inflicted heavy casualties, and took a number of captives. The colonial forces then hastily constructed the aptly named Fort Necessity, not far from Fort Duquesne. The French and Indian War lasted from about 1756 to 1763. This conflict was indistinguishable within the greater struggle between Britain and France called the Second Hundred Years' War. The Second Hundred Years' War, I won't tell you everything about it, but there was a conflict between the balance of power between the Bourbon and the Habsburg, Habsburg dynasties. Then there was conflict with the Leopold I in Austria, Holy Roman Emperor, struggles with the Turks, the French. Then France had the strongest army in Europe, the navy was larger in than England in in, uh, in Nether and Netherlands combined, so the Netherlands also were in wa involved. In fact, some of the sources that I've looked into call it a world war because it was in Europe and in America. So in, uh, during 1754 and 1755, the French de defeated in quick succession young George Washington, General Edward Braddock, and Braddock's successor, uh, Governor William Shirley of Massachusetts. Throughout this period, the British military effort was hampered by lack of interest in the home country, Britain. Rivalries among the American colonies and France's greater success in winning the support of the Indians. In 1756, the British formally declared war, but their new commander in America, Lord Loden, faced the same problems as his predecessors and met with little success against the French and their Indian allies. The tide turned in 1757, because William Pitt, the new British leader, saw the colonial conflicts as the key to building a vast British empire. Borrowing heavily to finance the war with France in Europe, 
He paid Prussia to fight in Europe and reimbursed the colonies for raising troops in North America. In July 1758, the British won their first great victory at Louisbourg near the mouth of the St. Lawrence River in a brilliant attack from the sea. The French were not only outmanned and outgunned, but were no match for the keen strategic choices made by the British naval officers, General Amherst and Brigadier James Wolfe, one of his subordinate commanders. At the peace conference in 1763, the British received Canada from France and Florida from Spain, but permitted Fran the France to keep its West Indian sugar islands and gave Louisiana to Spain. The treaty strengthened the uh, American colonies significantly by removing their European rivals to the north and south and opening the Mississippi Valley to westward expansion. There's an interesting excerpt in, um, in the book on uh, James Fenimore Cooper's early life, and you saw the picture of the book on the early, early slides. Quote, the revolution as Americans began remembering and commemorating it in the 1810s and 1820s was not a single simple event, but a large complex piece of unfinished business. Everything Cooper had heard over his youth and early adulthood told him so. The Delanceys, his in-laws, were hardly alone, for instance, in considering the war as a disruptive crisis of the status quo. They had made their peace with the English defeat and had come home. But like other former loyalists, they were wary of the new political and social order. Even for non-loyalists, the political settlement of the 1780s and 1790s was at best tentative. Support for the war had been uncertain in many quarters, not just among its outright opponents. And for those who had fought it or endured its violence, it had been a wrenching ordeal punctuated with doubt. In some ways, as the Second War indicated, even the final victory had been incomplete. Britain had continued to regard the United States with a mix of truculent disdain and condescension, hence the importance of impressment issue for Cooper and others. People know what the impressment issue is? Okay, you can ask me what it is. Okay. Worse yet, Americans themselves vacillated between faith in their own experiment and fawning deference to British opinion a perfect instance of the post-colonial mindset. Such deference was nowhere more evident than in the country's literary marketplace, which was dominated by imports from Britain." Unquote. The writing and publication of the spy Cooper's second novel, a story of intrigue set in America and written by an American, was another significant declaration of independence. With the writing of the pioneers, he had established his international fame. If there had been a film industry, the rights to produce it would have been requested immediately. As it turned out, his stories of a youthful and vibrant America were staged as plays in his own lifetime. So what I find interesting about, about um, these books they're full of action, they're full of activity, they're full of dialogue. He's really brilliant at dialogue. Full, he's brilliant at the accents because this is Amer early America. is really a multinational country, a uh, settlement, col colony, excuse me. So you have French, you have Dutch, you have Irish, you have Scottish, you have German who are, who are there. And he's very good about good historical detail. And he uses all of those dialects in the book. He didn't have to, but he decided to be truthful to the environment in which early America existed. And it was multilingual, multinational, and multi-ethnic uh, as well. So um, where was I going with this? I had a point here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot my point. 
But anyway, um, reading the books, you, you questions arise in my mind. And one of the questions I had when I was reading Last of the Mohicans, and Cooper's not very good about explaining things, but he, he just thinks just kind of, he ex kind of expects the reader to know it. And if I were a reader from the 1800s or 1900s, excuse me, I probably would understand it, but I had to do research. So in The Last of the Mohicans, Hayward sneaks into the Mingo uh, camp where um, the two women were kidnapped and uh, infiltrates. And I'm thinking, oh, how can he infiltrate? In the book, Chingachgook paints him up. And in the book, he says, the I will paint your face and body in such a way as to give you a certain personality. Well, I found that kind of interesting. So I did a little research on face pain. And we always, because we watch you know, movies about Indians, which are totally off, that face paint wasn't to go on the war path. Face painting had so many more uh, uses in ceremony. And for example, in The Pioneers, when he kills off Chingachgook, Chingachgook has painted his whole body with red streaks because he is going to allow himself to be killed by the fire in the forest there. And so I brought up some samples of face painting that's referred to in the book. And if you look at them, yeah, I guess in the dark, a white man who cuts his hair off or, or pulls his hair back, could look like an Indian and pass for an Indian and inf infiltrate into the Indian, Indian tribe. In fact, he may have been painted as uh, to depict someone who was simple and a fool so that he didn't have to talk with anybody. So it was, you know, I, like I said, doing that research made it perfectly understandable what he was doing. The picture down at the bottom I got in, at Siletz, uh powwow. So I wanted to read um, a little bit of the descriptions in The Pioneer, which is, like I said, my favorite book. And here is, um, here is a description, and it's probably a true description of the area of that period. Um, into the dusky shades of a background, but it was the appearance of the boundless forest that covered the hills as they rose in the distance one over the other that most Okay, got it. But it was the appearance of the boundless forest that covered the hills as they rose in the distance, one over the other, that most attracted the gaze of Miss Temple. The huge branches of the pines and hemlocks bent with the weight of the ice they supported, while their summits rose above the swelling tops of the oaks, beeches, and maples, like spires of burnished silver issuing from the domes of the same material. The limits of the view in the west were marked by an undulating outline of bright light, as if reversing the order of nature numberless suns might momentarily be expected to heave above the horizon. In the foreground of the picture along the shores of the lake and near to the village, each tree seemed studded with diamonds. So you can tell that these are things that he saw and he, and he had to put them into this one, you know, his first book about that area and the people of that area. Here he talks about the environment, one of the characters, and it also, again, once again, expressing what I think Cooper was what wanted to express. Quote, opinions on such subjects very much in different countries, says Marmaduke. But it is not as ornaments that I value the noble trees of this country. It is for their usefulness. We are stripping the forest as if a single year would replace what we destroy. But the hour approaches when the laws will take notice, not only the woods, but the game they contain also. I mean, there you go, the Endangered Species Act. So that's the other thing that I found marvelous about this book is how 
in tune, even then, with all the beautiful white America um, before them, that they should still, that they should express some kind of concern of the loss of that, of that wilderness. Another excerpt. And this is always Marmaduke, the judge, Miss Temple's da uh, father. No best, cried the judge in a more cheerful tone, disregarding the interruption of his cousin. He who hears of the settlement of a country knows but little of the toil and suffering by which it is accomplished. And he talks about the colonist. Unimproved and wild as this district, district now seems to your eyes, what it was when I first entered the hills. I left my party the morning of my arrival near the farms of the Cherry Valley, and following a deer path, rode to the summit of the mountain that I have since called Mount Vision. For the sight that there met my eyes seemed to me as a deception of a dream. The fire had run over the pinnacle and in great measure laid open the view. The leaves were fallen, I mounted a tree, and sat for an hour looking on the silent wilderness. This is something that James Fenimore Cooper got from his father, William Cooper, because he was the one that explored that area and um, acquired the, the land. But he, ex he expressed his wonderment and the beauty of what he saw in his diary. And I'm sure, you know, James Fenimore Cooper, that's how it, part of what his inspiration came from. So reading the book about Natty Bumpo also made me think of the Green Man. Does anybody know about what the Green Man mythology is? Okay. So the question is, is Natty Bumpo another manifestation of the Green Man mythology? A, personages, a personage, personage associated with nature whose human characteristics graft with nature's elements. Hundreds of these figures can be found throughout Europe, throughout the world. In Europe, the green man motif decorates cathedrals and churches. The green man, or the person that goes into the woods and lives as a bachelor, never marries, never has children, and lives there and protects the forest, and eventually dies there, is a recurring um, myth. And uh, the symbol of the green man is commonly said to symbolize growth and rebirth and tie to nature. Roman artists and sculptors developed composite lifelike figures intertwined with vegetation to decorate villas. The gods Pan, Bacchus, Dionysus, or Sylvanus were part of this mythology whose origins is at present unknown. The leaf-clad statue of Dionysus in Naples, Italy, dates to 420 BCE. Researchers point to figures in Mesopotamia that depict what one may call a green man, dating to 300 BCE. Also in Lebanon in the second century, a temple to Bacchus shows a leaf mask. There are many samples in Constantinople, Borneo, Nepal, and India. For the Celts, the green man mythology was compatible with their faith system, faith system, where the head was to believe to be the repository of the soul. So I have some discussion points. As many things as I learned from these books, it raised other it raised questions for me that I still think about. And one of the things that, uh, these are some of the points that I wanted to discuss with you or have the, everybody discuss with me. Who's going to do this side? Okay, Cooper. Mm -hmm. 
lost it. Okay. Cooper's personal conflict between the pioneer spirit at the expense of the native dwellers. Although he agrees with British property rights, he still mourns the loss of the ancestral cultures. And I, can't, and I have a little note in one of these books, and I put crocodile tears. I'm conflicted myself on where he's going with it. On the one hand, he goes into enormous detail about the native people, and he talks about how wonderful they are and how much he respects them through Natty's words. And then the, on the other hand, he is quite willing to um, be a landowner and continue to develop the land to benefit white settlers. So discussion. Anyone who want to discuss that point? Questions? So um, the second point. OK, go ahead, Charlene. Well, it might be um, a level of, hmm, I'm not sure of the word, but I think you can still mourn waste when you see people wasting things and yet still try to live within the elements. OK. Thank you, because I, I, couldn't, I couldn't answer that question for myself. That's, that's a very good point. So um, the Europeans had rules about property rights, and when they came to the New World, uh, not just the British, but every group, and except maybe the French. I don't know what did the French do differently. The trading, you pointed that out. But what about, um, where did all this come from? Uh, have In your research, did you understand how was it with the first one there got the land or how did, how did it work i mean how could you just do well that? the land was full of native americans so for the for the colonists to be there they had to push out the native americans in the literature that i read the delaware for example actually had a treaty we have the new yorker that's going to answer some of the question but what i read is that the delawares entered into some kind of property transfer. How that took place, well, the legitimacy of that, I cannot tell you who did it. I and mean, that seems to be a recurring theme throughout our troubled relationship with our Native Americans is the treaties that and the negotiations that we did. But according to this story, and this is Cooper's version of the story, and some of the stuff that I read on the internet, that somehow there was a transfer of property from the actual natives that lived there. J uh, Jim, do you have something to add to that? I don't know if it's to add to that. This is Jim. Um, but, you know, I ask myself often when I read this stuff, which was just like Ken, influenced me enormously as a kid. I mean, I saw myself as a pathfinder. Not so much a deer slayer, but a pathfinder. And I'd, I'd go out in the woods in moccasins and try to you yep. know, be super yep, quiet fun. and all that, and not leave a trail. Um, his attitude towards natives, I think, was contradictory, of course. Uh, but I think, in a way, it was because he felt that both he and the natives were really under God. And if they acted under God, that they would be fine. If they didn't, he had every right to kill them, which he did again and again. Mm -hmm. I mean, but... Initially, his attitude towards natives was that they were equal to him, I think. So you're talking about Cooper or Natty? I'm talking about Natty. Natty, okay, yeah. Cooper, who knows? I don't know for sure what Cooper's attitude Well, is. Natty always talks about um, the Delaware as his brothers, but he talks about the Mingo, which is Iroquois, and it took me a long research to find out what he, kept, what he meant by Mingo, as ruthless enemies that were like varmin, Right. I mean, that's pretty strong. That deserved to die. So yeah, there was pretty clear delineation in Cooper's books on the good guy and the bad guy, and I never, I really never got that because you know, yeah. Yeah. So the next point that um, uh, I found interesting about the books and uh, James um, Fenimore Cooper, the first six children he had were all female. And he finally did have a couple of sons towards the end. I think s most of the girls survived. And, uh, and the, his daughter Susan uh, helped him. So uh, all the heroines in these books, as you notice, are always girls. And uh, they all have different personalities, always sisters or s 
something of that nature, and they um, and they're always kind of spunky. And he expounds, but however, in his books, he's really clear about expounding on the social norms of the day on acceptable female behavior, retiring, demure, quiet, speak when you're spoken to kind of thing. You see that, and they're always Christian, and they're always, you know, uh, faithful to their fathers. It's usually their fathers that the whole story is about a, a father and the daughter. Um, so, and yet his main female characters, notwithstanding, he puts he puts all these social norms about how a woman should behave and how she's delicate. They are really rather, they're strong, they're spunky, intelligent, outspoken, and resourceful. And in the pioneers, the uh, woman that the Bess, or Elizabeth, uh, she uh, owns the property. She's going to be the owner of the property. And she jokes about, um, about telling her husband what to do. He's the one that married up. And in the book, he's not shy of putting words into this woman's mouth that she reminds her husband that she ca will be making decisions. And yeah, when I read The Pioneers, I thought, what? <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. However, he goes on and on and on and on in all his books about how delicate women are and how demure they are and how, you know, he, put, you know, and I'm going, well, you know, that doesn't, you know, even the, in, even the Indian women he depicts in this, this way, demure, d and, you know, retiring, delicate, uh, in which they were not. So the other, so anyone in, any input on that? Maybe, well, yeah, 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 Mrs. Casilla. Well, y you, you mentioned earlier that he really was writing for money. So therefore, he had to comply at least somewhat with the societal expectations of what female port portrayal of females ought to be. And yet I think that perhaps because he's writing these female characters as strong, resourceful, they are out there chopping wood and taking care of their families and doing all that sort of stuff. Perhaps he is also trying to create a role model that the younger women could follow who could say to themselves, well, here's an alternative and maybe we can do this. And I, and I had thought about that too because as a writer, you write for your editor and your editor is the one or literary agent, whoever it is now, they're the ones that say, you know, that's not a popular theme. You know, who's your audience? Maybe we should, uh, because he has mixed race people in the books. And golly, the mixed race people, the Indian and the white woman fall in love, but of course they die. And then in the pioneers, he, they think that uh, the main character, um, Edward, Edwin, Edward, uh, they always talk to him about him as if he were Indian. But golly, towards the end they say, no, I'm not really an Indian, I'm white. I was just adopted by the Indians. Oh, well, then she can marry him. So even though he talks about these things, then I think that maybe an editor said, well, wait a minute, I think you shouldn't have them marry. They need to die or something needs to happen. Or he needs to turn white at the right moment. So, uh, yeah, I can just hear the editor saying, you've got to be careful. Yes, but Ken, Ken. I, I'm not so cynical about his motives. I think that he was writing about extraordinary men and women. So the average woman was shy and retiring, but these extraordinary women were outstanding, just as uh, Chingagook and, and uh, Natty Bumpo were. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Good, good discussion. I love it. So another thing. Uh, Bumpo is shown as frail and old, but sturdy, sturdy and set in his ways. He says the laws do not apply to him, for he has spent about 70 years in the wilderness free of laws, but his own. Dichotomy about his admiration for Native Americans and expressed prejudice against marriage with Native American. So the couple of things here, he, he makes his own laws. So on the one hand, I totally admire him, He's free, he's the lord of all, everything he looks at, he owns nothing that he can't carry on his back, and yet in The Pioneers, he breaks the law because he kills a buck out of season. Jud the judge set the laws to protect the wildlife, 
But Natty Bumpo says, I've been living in these forests for 40 years without your laws, and now you're imposing them on me. And, you know, he, um, in a moment of weakness, he kills this buck and causes a whole series of problems for himself. So I'm torn. I love Nettie Bumpo, but on the other hand, Nettie Bumpo has no respect for any laws except his own. So that, and then he talks about being a Christian white man. It goes on and on about this. So many men, pioneer frontiersmen, married um, Native American women. They found they set up household and had children. There was never any problem or any concern about this. And yet, in the book, the last, excuse me, in the Deer Slayer, he, um, they threaten him with death, torture and death, if he did not marry a, a, a Native American woman, and he refused. So that was not, that was distasteful, but in the book, he was very clear about he would never marry. So again, I'm thinking, okay, what is some editor or somebody says, no, you can't have them doing that. You can't have our hero mm -hmm. marrying an Indian woman like the French would do. They go on and on about how the French, you know, set up households with Native American, but for somehow there's, there's this prejudice in this culture mm -hmm. that you can't have a hero of this book, you know, you know, set up household with a Native American woman or marry them. So um, anyway, I found that conflicting again. Once again, something that you can't pick characteristic of this person that immediately goes off in another direction and adds another twist to the, to the personality. Any thoughts on that? Um, Cooper is skilled at displaying better than most historical writers the actual demographics of early colonial America and includes people from German, Dutch, French, Irish, Scottish, and British cultures. He gives his characters their own special accent and dialect, including Natty, so he's really quite skilled in that. I mean, I think that's why um, so many movies, going back to the early era of movie making, that they've used his books for uh, film because they are uh, so well detailed and they're just perfect for, for film. And he goes into detail about, he develops the characters, each person has their own personality. In The Pioneers, I found it interesting that there is a Frenchman, Mr. Lequay, and he was there because he's a refugee. He decided to set up shop. So in today's world, you know, the issue of refugees and people that are refugees from conflict, um, that, uh, that's something I noticed more than I would notice the last time I read that book, where it wasn't such a big issue, the issue of, of refugees so much as, as it is today. And so I thought um, Cooper was marvelous in including um, that true, uh, true historical event that could have actually have happened, probably did happen. Any questions, any comment about the multicultural linguistic mix match in the early colonial period? Yeah, I always find it interesting when people uh, say that English ought to become the national language by law, and I'm, s and I'm saying, well, why English? Why not Dutch? You know, because they were here, and why not French? Why not Spanish? So. Um, and we have evidence that there were people here that spoke all kinds of languages with all kinds of dialects, including the Native Americans. Um, then the last point I make here is uh, Cooper touches on biracial relationships, uh, like I talked about before. And in the end, he either has them die off, the last of the Mohicans, or reveals they're really white in the pioneers. Any questions about that? Any, com any comments about that? Lester. Is Lester. Unfortunately, my comment goes back to the one about uh, being his own law. I keep thinking of Ammon Bundy uh, being there, saying it doesn't apply to me. The judge doesn't have jurisdiction over me, and uh, so we have that continuing among people uh, being free from uh, the legal system or believing they're free in their own interpretation of uh, what goes on. Marvelous analogy, yeah, thanks. Yeah, we, there's, <laughs> <laughs> we 
Yeah, his name was Harry Harry Truman um, on Mount St. Helens. He refused to leave. She said, this is where I live. You're not going to tell me to get out of here. And he, went, he was covered over by the... When Mount St. Helens blew, he stayed up there. Oh, there's oh the guy. Okay, I wasn't yeah. here during that. His oh, was yeah, him. yeah, yeah. He stayed yeah, there. He, got totally he was covered. kind of a, li- a mountain man. More than loner. kind of. Yeah, he's yeah. safe. You yeah. can come. I'm not going. Yeah. yeah. And he said, I've been here all my life. I'm not leaving. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lester has another question or comment. Lester. Dave. Yeah, this is Lester. When you talk about, uh, we just have to look at somebody like Jefferson. It's all right to have a sexual relationship with your slave, but it's not all right for them to be free or uh, equal person. Uh, So, you know, I think that extends in many ways, even to today, although we don't have legal slavery, there are many uh, relationships that seem to be uh, under the cover of darkness, but not exposed to light. Well, it used to be against the law to marry um, an African American. I mean, not just not s- a slave, but it's just against the law for a long time. And then, of course, it's against the law for same-sex marriages, and that's changing. So, uh, yeah, those those things do change. But with regards to Thomas Jefferson, uh, I, and I did some, I read a book, and I can't remember the author of it, but it was called The Intimate History of Thomas Jefferson, where um, Sally Hemsley was uh, Thomas Jefferson's wife's half-sister. Uh, tal- uh, Sally Hemsley, her father, therefore, was white. But not only her father was white, but her grandfather was white. He was Scottish. So not only did her mother had to give birth from a white man, but the great-grandmother also gave birth to a white man. So Sally Hemsley was uh, really substantially white. She was three-quarters white. So she could have, her daughter by Jefferson did pass for white, and she just kind of melted into the, she didn't want to have anything to do with some other anybody to cut off those, that association because she was so white. Now, um, um, when and Jefferson married uh, his the the woman I can't remember her name but when he married her, um, she brought Sally Hemsley because it was her slave and Sally Hemsley was a little girl when uh, the half sister who married Jefferson was grown up, and uh, and so Jefferson was he loved his wife deeply. In fact, he burnt all of their letters. That's how deeply he didn't want to share her with anybody. And Jefferson was a new a man who was so brilliant, he understood his position in history, but he wanted to keep his love life with his wife secret because he adored her so much and that was a way to honor her. So he goes to Europe with his daughters and then years later, Sally Hemsley comes over because she's the slave, comes over to take care of, to, she's grown up now and she can take care of the daughters. Well, when he sees Sally, w- his wife died. Sally was only eight years old. She was a little kid, and nobody paid attention. But when she went over there as a young woman of 14 or 15, then he noticed that this woman lo- probably looked like his wife. So my theory is this, is that he started a family with Sally Hemsley because he was deeply in love with his wife, and she looked like his, his, his dead wife. And I think part of the reason that he may not have released her in his lifetime was because he wanted her near him. And she also may have wanted to be near him. I don't know. We know nothing about her thoughts. But I I think that that, since she was substantially white, we always think of a slave as being, you know, African or black. Well, it wasn't always the case. They were, some of them were substantially white. And uh, I think he just kept her close by because uh, he loved her or because she was like his wife reborn. Um, This is Carmen. And would you clarify uh, the the, uh, Mohawks versus the Mohicans? Uh, The Mohicans fought with um, the Iroquois, but did the Mohawks or were they Iroquois? Uh, Let me go back to that. I always thought that the Mohawks were Iroquois. I didn't know about the Mohicans. So, uh, no, the Mohawk are separate. 
They're a separate um, group. They're oh, David, separate, go but ahead. They are part the, of the, the Mohican nation, aren't you they? You see on that that map there, you see Lenape. L e n a p i. That's the group from which the Delawares, aka Mohicans, came from. Oh, okay. And that's in New Jersey. All right. So it showed it above, but yeah, and the Mohawk are farther. So that's another group. There were there were hundreds of groups and villages. David, clear it up. He can clear it up. Clear it up. Yeah, he's. That mic is coming. The, the Iroquois were six different tribal groups in in uh, New York. The Mohawks were the f furthest east tribal group. During the French Indian War, the Mohawks tended to be on the side of the British because they were in uh, right next to the British. And the further west you went, the more French they were. And so the, those tribes tended to fight on the French side. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I have a couple other comments that doesn't have to do with that, if I may make them. Sure. One is that uh, in, in Indian tribes, there are clans, and the clans cross tribal boundaries. So there was a turtle clan, et cetera. But the clan's uh, designation did not pass through the father's side. It passed through the woman's side. Yeah, that's what I said in, yes. my, in my reading, that this it's matrilineal. <laughs> yeah. But, but these clans were uh, not, didn't designate a tribe, it designated something within a tribe, and all the tribes had these clans. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and that was, that's why the women uh, in not these chance. tribes were so important, because the bloodline went through the woman's side. And the other, the other factor is that from the time of the Spanish uh, War in uh, 1702 up to the Second World War, the major military factor in the world was the Royal Navy. And if the Royal Navy had not been dominant during the Seven Years' War, th the French may have won it. Oh, yeah. It was the luck of the draw. We're speaking English instead of French. It was, it was because of the pretty Royal much Navy. the luck of the draw. The, yeah. the Royal Navy choked off the French yeah, yeah. in Canada. They had Amherst. <laughs> you had, they had Amherst. That's what did it. They had a brilliant uh, admiral. A general. Yeah, excuse me. Yes. Hi, Franca. This Hi, is Betty. Betty. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of comments. One on the uh, selling of land. Native tribes did not sell land. They did not own land. It was Mother Earth owned by all. They didn't have a concept of ownership. So I'm not sure how anyone would think they had purchased British or British thought they owned the land. Of course, well. the British idea of ownership and the Indian idea or the Native American idea of ownership. Now, what I found interesting in this is that I'm learning about the tribes in the Northeast. We shouldn't paint a broad stroke and say the Northeast tri tribes are the same as the Prairie tribes are the same as uh, you know our tribes on the, on the Pacific Coast. They all had their own cultures and, and right. customs. Mm -hmm. So what I read, and I never understood, I didn't say buy, I said transfer, mm -hmm. title. Mm -hmm. How they did that, I don't know. Yeah. Whether it was legitimate, I don't know. Yeah. But it was in the book, this is how he justifies the story, that they these whites own this land because they were given the land. In the story, Chingachgook and the pioneers l wants to die in the end because he's there's no one left. Everybody else has moved farther west. And he said, um, I gave this land, my people gave this land to the people that are here. I think it's Cooper's justifying the fact that they're there. Because I, I find that pretty you know, fuzzy about giving the land. Somebody no, says you gave us the land. And you know, that's how they got rid of the Cherokees. I don't know how they did it. It Somehow makes a good story or a good argument. But it, it makes a good story, isn't. good argument. In any case, uh, even here in Oregon, mm -hmm. people came and the the Indians didn't give them in anything, but they took land. And how they did it, I don't know how the how the so-called title was transferred. I but don't it's think a there fresh a it's a fresh I story it, history. If I occupy this piece of dirt, it's mine. With a gun, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. 
it's mine yeah yeah the other comment is on the on the marriages um much of what our history involves is the puritan ethic from those guys so the intermarriage thing may have come through that line rather than any other avenue well the true story is that there were a lot of um the indians did take slaves Oh yeah, and uh, yeah. if uh, if somebody and amongst each other they took slaves, not just Absolutely. white slaves, mm -hmm. you know, pioneers. And if uh, somebody from one tribe killed somebody from another tribe, mm -hmm. then that tribe had to give them a replacement. My and grandmother's sister was captured oh by really? Native Americans, and my great grandmother went into the encampment of Indians who had her daughter and took her back. Um, so there you go. You could Great do that. And well, there are stories of women that stayed. Mm -hmm. They couldn't go back. They didn't want yeah. to go back. Well, she was a, a child, a yeah, young yeah. child, and uh, Great Grandma was pregnant with my m grandmother at the time, so maybe they honored that. Yes. But she was yeah. not going to take no for an answer, and she got her blonde-haired daughter back from those Indians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jim. Hi, this is Jim again. Uh, I was a little disappointed that David hasn't given us more information about um, Cooper's career as a naval officer and as a merchant marine. I think he was in the merchant marine for five years, and then he was in the Navy as an officer for 13 years or so? No, not 13, but yeah. But a long, a time. long time. I think he was only a junior, very junior officer when he was in the Navy. A midshipman is what I, uh, in the U.S. Navy. Yeah, and he loved the sea because in all of his books, every one of his books, he adds a character that has either retired from the sea or has some connection with the sea. But yeah. he's certainly not a Joseph Conrad, and I expected much more in his work to, to reflect his career. I mean, he talks well, about Well, I only read the Natty Bumpo ones. There are other ones out yeah. there. I've never, I haven't read The Pilot, for example, and that is about, um, uh, you know, takes place on the sea, so I don't know. Majority seem to be. Uh, yeah. Days. I want to go back to the issue of land transfer. Um, one of the very first of the legal systems that was set up in this country had to do with land transfer. And as we're all aware, at least along in the colonies, our idea of land transfer came from England, when that's a very, 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 very old body of law. It's at least as old as um, estate law in general. And so when the colonists came out, and that was also true when the colonists, uh, our pioneers here, got to Oregon, we may, you know, remember that the very first legal case in Oregon, which actually established the, the territory of Oregon and the state of Oregon, had to do with who was in charge of a person, who was going to inherit a chunk of land so land transfer, you just came out, you staked a claim to a certain area that you could measure off or you could identify by meets and bounds or by trees and mountains or whatever, and you, you wrote it up as a description. And, and we, uh, the legal system at that time was in its infancy. It's established a recording system. And you went down and you said, I own all this land. I've just claimed all this land from this river west to some other river or this river west of a mountain that I have now named Mountain Whatever. And that's, uh, that's how they established the first, first of the land claims. And once it was recorded and documented in that way, and that's why we had all these fights out here in the west about who owned land, same, same problem, um, then you technically, in the eyes at least of the colonial governments, you owned it regardless of whoever else was on the land. Any other questions? All right, fun presentation, thank you.